Hello and welcome to the Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Beter, and today I will present part six of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. Last time we talked about John Wilkes Booth getting serious now about assassinating the president instead of kidnapping him, and the actions or reactions of other conspirators. I mentioned that there was a degree of flexibility yet in Booth's plans. A couple of indications of this are, number one, the advanced hour at which he learned that Lincoln would be at Ford's Theater the night of Friday, April 14th, and number two, the possible inclusion at this point of General Ulysses S. Grant on the execution list. Let's look at number one. While the conspirators were ready to act on Friday after their Thursday night meeting at the Herndon House, Booth had no concrete knowledge of where Lincoln would be Friday night. As mentioned earlier, Booth had been refreshing his memory of all the entrances, exits, and passages at both Ford's and Grover's National Theater, so he would be prepared to strike at either location, whether in a kidnapping or an assassination. On Thursday afternoon, upon his return from his frustrating meeting with Michael O'Loughlin in Baltimore, Booth rudely and uncharacteristically broke in on a script reading in the manager's office at the National to ask of the plans for Thursday night. Manager C. Dwight Hess said he was going to illuminate the theater in concert with every other business in town, but he was more excited about Friday night when he was going to commemorate the fall of Fort Sumter with a much more impressive display. Are you going to invite the president? Booth asked him. Yes, Hess responded. Booth's question actually at this point reminded Hess to send an invitation to First Lady Mary Lincoln, who had always worked directly with him in the past. At this point then, Booth is contemplating an attack at the National, not at Ford's. Friday morning, the conspirators made ready. George Atzerott went to the Kirkwood House, Vice President Johnson's hotel, and secured a room for a day in advance. Lewis Powell made another casual visit to the Seward home to ask after the secretary's health. After breakfasting at his hotel, Booth strolled to Ford's theater to collect his mail. He was there in time to hear Harry Ford, the brother of theater owner John Ford, say that a messenger from the White House had just reserved a box for that night's performance. Also, the Lincolns planned to bring General Grant along. Booth gave no indication that Ford had just sealed Abraham Lincoln's doom. He calmly sat down on the front steps of Ford's theater and read a letter from a girlfriend, one that was not his secret fiance. On to number two. The later editions of the newspapers that had calmly reported that the Lincolns were going to the theater Friday night were much more excited to broadcast the news that General Grant, the hero of the hour, would be with them. They loudly proclaimed that the Lincolns and the Grants would be at that evening's production of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater. Despite his apparent composure, Booth pounced greedily on this new development. Lincoln and Grant will be together in the theater that Booth knows so intimately, in the box that he has minutely examined with his cohorts. Fate was apparently smiling on him offering a two-for-one assassination bonanza. Well, we know otherwise, so what happened? The Grant couple was indeed the Lincoln's first choice to accompany them to the theater. But Mary Lincoln may have saved the life of Sam Grant as a consequence of her abominable behavior to Grant's wife, Julia. Let's spool back a few weeks and recall Lincoln's visit to City Point, Virginia, to visit Grant and his army. Lincoln ended up staying away from Washington for 16 days, from March 23rd through April 8th. Mary was with him most of that time, 
but I'd gone back to Washington from April 1st to April 5th before returning to City Point for the remainder of Abe's stay. This absence is explained in large part by an unfortunate incident in which Mary Lincoln thoroughly lost her temper and caused acute embarrassment all around. I am, I understand, straying far afield of the assassination story at a critical juncture. It's almost as if I want to delay as long as possible describing the cold-blooded murder of my revered hero and role model. Also, I'm just about to display at her worst the much maligned and cruelly afflicted Mary Lincoln. But those who cannot remember past scandals are condemned to repeat them. And it is my duty to deliver you from that fate. And now the story of how Mary Lincoln saved Ulysses S. Grant from assassination at Ford's Theater. General Grant had invited the president to visit him near the front as the rebel army grew weaker and weaker. The Lincolns, Abraham, Mary, and Tad, with a small party of other companions, left Washington at 1 p.m. on March 23rd. They were bound for City Point, Virginia, the huge federal base supplying the soldiers besieging Petersburg, the last line of defense for the Confederate capital of Richmond. They arrived Friday night, the 24th, at about 9 p.m. The following morning, after the Lincolns received a visit from their son Robert, now a captain on General Grant's staff, the General and Mrs. Grant boarded the River Queen, and First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln had her first meeting with future First Lady Julia Dent Grant. Folks, Mary Lincoln had her good side. Never forget that she visited thousands of soldiers in hospitals, taking them flowers and fruit, giving comfort to boys with hideous wounds, and writing letters home for them. But she was also thin-skinned, highly strung, and imperious. On this occasion, after introductions and pleasantries, the husbands went off to discuss the war, leaving the wives to get acquainted. It did not go well. As they began to converse, Julia Grant sat next to Mary on the sofa she was occupying. This elicited an indignant look from Mary that brought Julia up short. I crowd you, I fear, she said. Not at all, answered Mary. After a decent interval, Julia moved to another seat. An unfortunate misunderstanding, an unguarded reaction after a tiring river and sea voyage of 33 hours, Perhaps, but the fun had just begun. On Sunday, a prominent part of the visitor's itinerary was a review of General Edward Ord's Army of the James, located several miles away at Malvern Hill. Instead of keeping pace with the ambulance that transported Mary and Julia, President Lincoln rode ahead on horseback with the generals. Add to that that the road was terrible and one bump bounced the ladies so high that they hit their heads on the top of the wagon. Add to that that General Ord's wife, Mary, was also on horseback. And it came to Mary Lincoln's attention that Mary Ord was riding in company with the president at the head of the column. The First Lady came unhinged. What does the woman mean by riding by the side of the president and ahead of me? Does she suppose that he wants her by the side of him, she raged. Julia did her best to defuse the situation, but it just brought her into Mary's sights. I suppose you think you'll get to the White House yourself, don't you, she flung at Julia. Julia replied that she was happy where she was, but Mary kept at it. Oh, you had better take it if you can get it. Tis very nice. It didn't end there. When Mary Ord rode over to meet them, Mrs. Lincoln positively insulted her, called her vile names in the presence of a crowd of officers, and asked what she meant by following up the president, wrote Grant's aide, Adam Badeau, who was also riding in the ambulance. He continues, The poor woman burst into tears and inquired what she had done, but Mrs. Lincoln refused to be appeased and stormed till she was tired. That night, the Grants were guests of the Lincolns aboard the River Queen. Did Mary meekly apologize for her behavior earlier in the day? She did not. Badeau says she turned her wrath on General Ord, 
telling Abe that Ord was unfit for command and should be removed. Then she lit into her ungrateful wretch of a husband, whom she accused of flirting with Mary Ord. In her memoirs, Julia Grant said that Adam Badeau's account exaggerated Mary's behavior on that day. But the behavior did leave an impression on Julia, nonetheless. Let us now spool back up to April 14th and judge effects. The newspapers already had the Grants accompanying the Lincolns to Ford's Theater that night, but the Grants had not yet even been invited. The general attended Lincoln's cabinet meeting that day, which ran from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m., and which was highlighted by Grant's description of the final days of his long duel with Robert E. Lee. A side note, I cannot forbear to comment on this picture, but I will wait till the end of the story. When the meeting broke up, Lincoln asked Grant if he and the missus would go along to the play that night. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, by the way, thought it was a terrible idea and voiced his fear of possible assassins. Lincoln thought the people deserved to see the president and his top general in their moment of triumph. Grant, who was uncomfortable in the spotlight, wanted nothing more than to leave town. So he was mightily relieved when the message for him arrived from Julia in which she gave a number of reasons why she wanted to leave that afternoon for their home in Burlington, New Jersey. Grant begged off the theater invitation and Lincoln, gracious but disappointed, assented. Julia gave reasonable and inoffensive excuses, but her main objection to going to the theater with the Lincolns, which the whole town now expected, was her disinclination to spend that much time with Mary Lincoln as she freely admitted to her close friends. She can hardly be faulted as her only exposure to Mary was their disagreeable interlude at City Point. Julia's feelings were reinforced from another quarter. According to Badeau, Ellen Stanton, wife of the Secretary of War, dropped in on Julia that day and said they had been invited as well, but told her, unless you accept the invitation, I shall refuse. I will not sit without you in the box with Mrs. Lincoln. So the Grants didn't go to the play. But was General Grant seriously considered as a target by Booth and his accomplices? Further recollections of Julia Grant and others give credence to such a possibility. As noted above, there was a public expectation of the Grants attending the theater, but no invitation from the Lincolns until after 2 p.m. But around midday, Julia answered a knock on her door at the Willard Hotel and found an odd-looking character who told her that the Lincolns would call for the Grants at 8 p.m. to pick them up for the theater. Having not yet received an invitation of any sort, Julia found this visit disturbing. Shortly, she went to lunch with her son Jesse and friends. Across the room, she thought she recognized the messenger in a group of four suspicious-looking characters. But her attention mainly was drawn to another of the four, a dark pale man who, quote, played with his soup spoon, sometimes filling it and holding it half lifted to his mouth, but never tasting it, unquote. She whispered to her companion that the group had been eavesdropping on them, and she feared some sort of outbreak that night. I just feel it, she said, and am glad I am going away tonight. Young Jesse Grant remembered the next part of the story. The Lincolns had loaded their luggage on a carriage and headed to the station for a 6 p.m. train. They were rattling down Pennsylvania Avenue with General Grant sitting in front alongside the driver when a horseman galloped up beside them. The man leaned over and peered into the carriage. Then he wheeled his horse and rode furiously away, wrote Jesse years later. The rider circled around and again examined passengers in the carriage. Julia Grant said that he thrust his head at the general and glared at him both times. Julia recognized the writer as the pale-faced man at the restaurant who toyed with his soup spoon. The man was John Wilkes Booth, according to later testimony by John Matthews, one of Booth's friends who refused to join the plot. Matthews had pointed out the Grant's carriage to Booth as they stood outside the National Theater prompting Booth to gallop after them. Booth had just learned, to his evident vexation, 
that the papers were wrong and the Grants were leaving town instead of going to the theater. If it hadn't been for Mary Lincoln's shockingly offensive behavior at City Point, Julia Grant would not have been so eager to talk her way out of the Lincoln's invitation. And that is how Mary Lincoln, at least conceivably, saved Ulysses S. Grant from assassination at Ford's Theater. And now, back to that picture. First of all, you can see that it used as its model Francis Carpenter's first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, an event that occurred in July of 1862. Let's examine the differences. On the far left, we see Grant and Lincoln. So they got that right. They were both definitely there. Grant replaces Secretary of War Edwin Stanton in the chair to Lincoln's right. Stanton was also present. He is moved to the chair in front of the table, which, in Carpenter's painting, was occupied by Secretary of State William H. Seward. Seward is moved out of the chair and is now standing erect behind Stanton, which is rather ironic because Seward was not only absent from the meeting, he was confined to bed with grievous wounds from his carriage accident. He was represented at the meeting by his son Frederick, who was also his Assistant Secretary of State, and of whom more later. Standing to Lincoln's left with his hand thrust into his coat is Salmon P. Chase, who stands to Lincoln's right in the Carpenter painting. Chase had been Secretary of the Treasury in 1862, but he resigned in 1864, and by the time of the last cabinet meeting, he was actually Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He was not present at the cabinet meeting. He had been replaced by William Pitt Fessenden, but it was his replacement, Hugh McCulloch, who was at the meeting. In both pictures, there are two men with white beards seated on the far side of the table. For some reason, they have switched places. But the more bewildering question is why one of them is there at all. In the Carpenter painting, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells is next to Lincoln and Attorney General Edward Bates is on the far end. In the last cabinet picture, Bates is moved closer to Lincoln when he should have been moved out of the picture entirely. By this time, he had been replaced as Attorney General by James Speed. Wells was indeed still in the cabinet. The two remaining figures standing behind the table in both pictures are Secretary of the Interior Caleb Smith, the shorter one on the left in the Carpenter picture, and Postmaster General Montgomery Blair on the right. They are switched in the last cabinet picture, but they shouldn't have been switched. They should have been removed. Blair had been replaced the previous year by William Dennison, and Smith was replaced by his deputy, John Usher, in 1863. So, of the nine people in the picture, five of them weren't actually there. I don't know who painted this picture or where it came from. I just found it on the internet. It's just another example of how careful you need to be when you're studying history. Don't take things at face value. Don't just research your subject. Research your sources. Okay, thanks for indulging in that. I'll see you next time on The Conspirators Part 7.